Hello, everybody, on Facebook Live and here in the audience, and welcome again to another edition of the Sci Cafe. Uh, I'm your moderator, John Tanachi, and we have a very complicated topic today. We're discussing sustainability because in partnership with the uh, uh, Facilities Management and the Sustainability Committee, uh, this is Sustainability Month at CAO, so uh, hence connecting all of these themes. And it's actually a complicated topic, so we're going to break from the usual format. I want to hear from the audience and from Facebook Live, if, if people are daring. I want to hear what your definition of sustainability is. I want to get uh, everybody set on, on how complex a topic this can be. Who wants to volunteer with a definition of sustainability? I know some of you took Tad's class, so you're ready. Anyone? Anyone? Oh, really? All right, there we go. Good. My hope is... Yeah. So what do you think is the definition of sustainability? That's a beautiful throw. Thank you so very much. <laughs> that, that was not sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say um, to do things in a sustainable manner means to do things in a way beneficial to economy so we can, you know, so we can make money, in a way that's productive to society so it makes our lives um, easier and people more connected and in a friendly way to the environment. So we're not, ideally we're, we're causing no harm. So I would say these like three pieces, the environment, economy, and society. Good, anybody else wanna to add to it? Yeah, toss it around. So sustainability uh, by, my, by my reckoning is a descriptor um, which is used to describe a system that can be perpetuated for an infinite amount of time um, and the inputs to that system have to be renewable on a time scale that uh, allows the system to basically continue on. So answer yes or no. Are you an engineer? Yes. Okay, that's all <laughs> I needed. To, that was a very engineering answer. I like that. I like, who else? One more. I want to set the stage. Go ahead up here at the front. Um, I agree with uh, Adrian's uh, definition, but due to that definition, sustainability cannot be achieved because it has to be in a uh, resources has not in, shouldn't be uh, has to be in the circle and in human time scale it's not possible wow that's a good way to here toss that back here so the the point of today i mean even those three perspectives are a little bit different right the point of today is we have three experts that will introduce themselves in a second I'm going to ask them a few questions to set the stage on what is sustainability, how do they define it, and what we're trying to do today is these are three KAUST faculty. Uh, their research is connected to sustainability, so we're going to try and probe how their research is connected to that broader topic and, and the sustainability that affects you and your daily lives. Um, so after a few questions, then we come back to what we just did, which is you guys asking the panelists for their opinion. So please. Listen to what they have to say, listen to their expertise, but then challenge them in a few minutes with some questions. Please have those ready. Okay, so I'm going to start down at the end with Tad. So if you don't mind, each of you introduce <coughs> yourself, and I'd like your definition as an expert of sustainability. Okay, so perhaps let's start from the definition of sustainability. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll cite my own definition that I published in 204. Uh, so a cyclic process, so a process which repeats itself in cycles can be sustainable if it can be maintained without loss of quality forever, and forever is in quotes, you have to define what you understand through forever, and if the environment from which this process takes inputs and dumps its waste, it's also maintained forever. So there are two elements to this process. One, the system itself has to be cyclic, and two, its interactions with the environment are such so that it does not degrade the environment uh, at different time scales. We are obviously interested in human time scale. Um, now, very briefly about myself. So I'm, I'm a dual career guy. So uh, I'm a petroleum engineer uh, uh, and reservoir engineer, chemical engineer and physicist by, by education. Uh, but I have delved in, in greatly into issues of sustainability, ecology, uh, major agricultural systems, uh, plantations, tropical plantations, and survivability 
of human race, given what we're doing to the planet. So, more later. If you haven't figured out already, Tad is an interesting character because you wouldn't expect the petroleum engineer of the bunch to be somebody who knows arguably the most about sustainability. So, Tarova, you want to chime in with your definition? Sure. Um, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Tarova Lekhnes, and uh, my background is environmental engineering. So I'm a professor in environmental engineering with water treatment being my, my most uh, sort of focused area of research. Now, when it comes to the definition of sustainability, this is a tough one because we see different uh, definitions uh, depending on, on what eyes you look at it. But if you look at, at the science of sustainability, and it was mentioned here in the audience, there are three basically uh, pillars in this. One is economic development, social development, and environmental protection. And then it becomes what is meant by that. Um, and if you look in, in, in context of those things, and in terms of what has happened in the society from a political point of view, it's all come around the Millennium Development Goals that were proclaimed in the United Nations, where poverty or the elimination of poverty was one of the most important aspects in defining sustainability. And that relates back then to the economic growth, the social growth, health, the well-being, et cetera, et cetera, and protecting the environment. And so then the question is, within the sustainability, how do you match a complex system which is understanding the interactions between society and nature and preserving what we have for future generations? And I'll leave it with that for the time being. All right. Mark, you want to add yours? It's great. We're surrounded here by physicists and engineers <laughs> and people who have a very quantitative and analytical perspective. We hear of different scales where you're thinking about levels of society through to the universe. <laughs> and uh, I'm just a plant guy, all right. <laughs> I grow plants, and I'm interested in how plants work, and I'm interested in how plants are adapted to the environment, and how we can use that knowledge to try to improve our ability to maintain crop yields in an environment which has been increasingly unsustainably degraded. And, uh, and so that's, that's what I do. Good. And uh, my definition of sustainability tends to be thinking at a global level and thinking at a biological level. And I just want to be able to have or see people do what they do <laughs> and be able to do that in perpetuity without degrading the planet and its resources. Right. Is that all right, Tad? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I do defer to Tad here. <laughs> no, and, and so then let's take this a little bit further to, to help the audience, because I think I, I, this audience is very educated. I'm, I'm impressed already. Mm. The, the definitions match quite well with our experts. But there is a, a daily life element of sustainability. There is something that each of us can do. Um, and I think we want to spend a few minutes trying to connect the research that you do in the labs uh, to that larger sustainability conversation. So, Tad, maybe you could say a little bit about your research uh, prior to KAUST and here at KAUST that relates to sustainability. Well, <coughs> th that's a very tough question to answer briefly and interestingly to the audience. So, first of all, I would like to challenge the common notion of saying growth and this and that and the environment. You saw this repeated uh, more than once. It's not and the environment. It is the environment mm. and everything else. It's the other way around. The environmental services that we take for granted, which is clean air, drinkable water, unspoiled uh, soil, um, are not there forever and cannot be abused so, uh, with impunity. Uh, and also, I'm here, I'm talking in particular about the Red Sea water from which we take our drinking water and fish supplies. Um, so we have to be careful not to live so much in the economic sphere of humans uh, where our um, worldview was formed in the late 18th and 19th century by the most influential economists. They were justified at the time to think that the human economy was relatively small compared with the planet. It's not the case anymore. So before we could dump our wastes into the environment and the planet would forgive us 
and it has been forgiving us for the last 200 years, not anymore. So I would like to, to, to kind of imprint on the audience that whether it's our personal life or social life, we have to really think about the limits that we have to impose on ourselves so that our children can also live on a planet which will not be completely spoiled. Okay? So now to the personal life. Um, when we talk about the bi big issues of sustainability, usually people do two things. I don't care, I can do anything about it, or I freeze. Oh, it's so large, I really cannot do anything about it. That is not true. Everybody can do something about sustainability. One of them is to understand how much energy I use power. It's energy per unit time. Uh, it's another misnomer, right? We always talk about energy, but really, it's not energy, it's not uh, megajoules per 100 years, it's megajoules per second. It's power that we use uh, in our lives, okay? So how much power do we use in every, our de every uh, day lives? And that power comes in many flavors. Comes as electricity, right? Which is the highest form of free energy. It's like water flowing, powering pretty much anything. Mm. It comes in terms of heat that we use for, for cooking, for hot water, and it comes from everything else we waste on our way to the store, all these endless plastic bags that we take because we never can remember to take the reusable bag to Tamimi, right? And it also relies on us knowing how much energy, how much electricity we use every month. How many people in the audience know how many kilowatt hours you used in the last year every month. Uh, okay, I can see my class very good <laughs> and, and some others, yes. For, for the record, that was about a third of the audience. That's yeah. pretty solid. Yeah. I, so, I think we have to chalk a little bit of that up to, we get an email every month that yes. tells us our energy usage and compares it to the average. So thank you to the facilities people because otherwise I would have no idea, I wouldn't be able to answer Tad's yeah. question. So, so, so uh, j just I don't want to you know, kind of monopolize the discussion, but if you understand uh, that at, in the best of circumstances, uh, and data may be wrong here, I have used 1,660 kilowatt hours in January, and the class uh, and the house in my class uh, used 6,700 kilowatt hours in the same month then if I compare it to what I have used uh, at my, well, right now empty home in Austin, uh, I have exported about a thousand kilowatt hours from my solar cells to the grid. So, by that standard, I am infinitely unsustainable here at KAUST uh, relative to what I can achieve in Austin. But that's just one part of it, because what we don't see is the immensely expensive water we use, which comes from desalination, right? And, and Tor is going to tell us more, we cannot be wasting that water, okay? We are, every day, okay? And that's power, fossil power, pure and simple, floating into oblivion, into the universe, right? Okay, I'll stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's a good segue. Turov, do you yeah. want to chime in on the water side of this? Sure, absolutely. I mean, this is a, a, an extremely valid point in terms of, of uh, the amount of energy that is related into producing pure water and the amount of water that's needed to produce the energy. So this is the whole cycle that we often talk about the water energy nexus in terms of this. But sometimes we forget there's also a food component in that. So it's the water, <laughs> food, and energy nexus. And, and w which it all relates back together because it's, it's some of these things that's on an individual level but it's also on a society level. So my research interest is very much in changing paradigms in how we perceive you know, the water and the food. So, so one example, and, and I'll give you a little bit why I'm interested in this. So the predictions are that by 2050, 75% of the world's growing population is going to live in urban and peri-urban environments. So what do you need in the, those environments? You need the water, in addition to the energy. You need food. And what happens with all the water that we make expensively in the urban environment? Well, we discharge it, right? So now we have a resource, which hasn't been viewed as a resource before, which can be used. And what is the biggest usage of water? It's for agriculture. So, so my interest is taking, putting together the, the food and water nexus and saying, can we reclaim water in an urban environment for urban agriculture? 
and that way try to alleviate some of the challenges that are in the Millennial Development Goals and which relate back to the perception of what is sustainability or making something that's a sustainable future where the basic fundamentals required to reduce poverty, to increase health, to increase the, the life, etc., etc., without a detrimental effect to the environment is possible. So that's kind of the, the cutting edge on, on where my research interests lie. And, and just so you guys know, here we do reuse the water at Kaust for agricultural purposes, 100%. Uh, so we are living that here at Kaust. Um, segue to the agricultural side. Mark, maybe you can yep. connect your research <laughs> to, again, this, this larger food, energy, water nexus. Sure, sure. Um, as I said before, I'm interested in how plants work and plant adaptation, why some plants grow well when you're down next to the beach and other plants don't grow well when you're down next to the beach. And when you go inland, there are different sets of plants growing. And I'm very interested in trying to understand what genes are in the plants that can grow down next to the beach, which are missing on the genes inland. Can we understand the costs and benefits of those trade-offs that the plants are clearly having to make for themselves and have evolved um, over the past? And then can we use that knowledge to try to increase the ability of plants to maintain their growth when their conditions are suboptimal? When there's low nitrogen, for example, we can talk a lot about water, which I think is the most important um, limitation in agriculture, but nitrogen's way up there as well, and we've completely perverted the, altered and the nitrogen cycle. And phosphorus. And phosphorus. Yep. And phosphorus. So, Back to water. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, for us, what we're interested in is using our knowledge of how plants are adapted to these suboptimal conditions to see if we can improve our agricultural productivity and reduce the inputs or change the inputs so they are more sustainable for our agricultural systems. And the main thing that we're focusing on is salinity tolerance, and I'll admit completely that I started this work actually when I was in Cambridge and it was completely driven for academic and intellectual purposes. And I'm a very strong believer and supporter of fundamental sciences, like I'm a strong supporter of the arts. So I think these are <laughs> very, very important things we should have. Uh, but I like to apply my academic knowledge and I want to understand how plants can tolerate salinity. And the relevance to this and sustainability is that probably most of you don't appreciate or know this, but about a third of our food that's produced on the planet is produced under irrigation. <laughs> it's an amazing, massive fraction of the world's uh, food production is produced under irrigation, and most of those irrigation systems are not sustainable. So you go to northern India, which is the, the original bread basket of the world in the Ganges Valley, where you have in the Punjab these amazing wheat yields and it's all irrigated and none of that is sustainable. We are sleepwalking rapidly to a major disaster in food production and that's because of our mining of groundwater and surface waters, but groundwaters in particular are being mined and as those waters get reduced and depleted so their quality goes down in particular their salinity goes up. Now we can have the band-aid fix of trying to help plants grow better with the water quality as it goes down but I think we need to do something much more radical and that's really where our research has been developing here at Kaus and really has only developed since I've been at Kaus because we've got the opportunities with all sorts of good collaborators to do this. And what I want to be able to do is develop a new agricultural system where we're actually basing the irrigation not on water, which we need to both preserve for future generations and use for other higher value purposes and use water that we cannot currently access. So water that is brackish or salty and if we're able to use this and use it sustainably while we're not depleting the soil quality and not depleting aquifer quality, if we're able to do this, it unlocks all sorts of opportunities to make our food production sustainable, free up the water that we're using. What is it, 70% of our wor world's water is used 80%. globally, 70, 80%. The numbers are a bit wobbly. It doesn't matter. It's a lot of that water is used for agriculture. Let's see if we can use other water and use it sustainably for food production. Mm -hmm. So uh, 
just a reminder, because I want to turn it over to you to ask questions in a second. But I want to give you the Cliff Notes version in case you just walked in. Mark works on the biochemistry to understand plants so that we can use partially desalinated water. So that experts like Tarove don't have to use all of that technology and all that energy to desalinate the water. That energy tends to come from people like uh, Tad that pulled it out of the ground, petroleum engineering. That means that that energy can be given to somebody like Jorge, who's in the front row, Catalysis Center Director, to make higher value chemicals. <laughs> so this is the type of connected research that's happening here at Cal. Maybe, Tad, you can add the one piece we haven't covered so far, which is maybe the CO2 piece, maybe some of the pollutants that are uh, definitely right. unsustainable at this stage. All right, so, so now coming back to my profession. <laughs> uh, so my profession is completely unsustainable okay? um, by any uh, definition, and especially by thermodynamic definition, right? I operate in linear processes, which have a beginning and an end. Right? So you start an oil field, you produce it, you end. Yes? That is not a cycle. Okay? <laughs> not a cycle. Okay? Now, the effect of us starting these oil and gas fields and, and producing also coal and, and uranium is the incredible amount of power that is powering our highly developed societies. Okay? A society is a mega-organism which is way out of equilibrium and it's powered through the flux of energy flowing through it. And the more energy flows through a society, the more complicated it can get. We can have universities, we can have museums, we can have arts, we can have all these wonderful things which are powered by things we don't see. But these things will go away because, as I said, my job is unsustainable. My shorter job description is to extend the lifetime of, of the fields, increase the level of recovery without uh, excessive environmental uh, bad effects so that we can maintain production for longer and keep the civilization fed with the ample power. It needs to move to something else which uses less of, of this irreversibly unsustainable power and provides for, for life for n of n other generations, of future generations. And that would be much more related to solar um, uh, energy and the cycles it produces. Okay? But in order for us to get there, we need to finance it in energy and in monetary sense by fossil power. Okay? We're not doing it very well. In most societies on the planet, don't actually do it very badly, okay? Because that requires much longer term planning, uh, much more sophisticated planning, and looking at systems, not just at little parts of, mm. of, of the economy. I, Mother Earth doesn't do growth. You have to understand this, that Mother Earth produces about the same amount of biomass each year on land and in the oceans. And it's plus minus 110, uh, gigatons of carbon on land and 60% of it or 50 in the oceans and seas. It has not changed for many, many decades. Uh, we've measured it by satellites for you know, more than a decade now, but it hasn't changed for a lot. And yet the human concept that we repeat in this audience, in, in the universities, in all governments, on TV every day, what's the most popular word we hear? Growth, right? Yes, growth. What, what does growth mean? That means that I add something to something every year. What does it translate into in mathematical terms? It translates into exponential increase of that which I add, right? And of course, on this planet, on this finite sphere, exponential growth is impossible. Impossible, right? Got that? Okay? So if it is impossible, we have to do something else. But in order to do something else, we need to be prepared to talk about it, to have a meaningful discussion, to understand the issues. Okay? And so that's what we're trying to do here, the three of us, and then more of us hopefully in the future. So, so who's ready to argue with that? That's his invitation. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want to know? You, you know the fields. You know what they're working on now. What more do you want to know from the panelists? 
Questions? <laughs> Nat, I've got one. Oh, is there a question? Yes. Yeah, there, there is. There was okay. a question. Good. Here you go. Ready? Ready? Yeah. Catch. <laughs> okay. Good catch. I used to play cricket when I was. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, I think uh, the points that you have made are very profound, but uh, there's one thing I would like to raise, which was missing here: um, population. Ah, yes. So how do we address that? I know that uh, all the points that you mentioned are to sustain the growing needs of, well, in 50 mm -hmm. years, how 70 percent growth of urban population population or so, but. Well, how do we address the population issue, which can probably solve most of these problems? Mark, why don't mm -hmm. you tackle that first from a food perspective? <laughs> <laughs> oh, population's definitely a, a massive issue. I love this football flying around the place. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and I often say to myself, yes, if I truly cared, <laughs> I'd actually be working on, um, on socially acceptable sustainable uh, methods for controlling population growth, but I faint at the sight of blood in our study plants. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I, I actually want to pick up on one thing Tad said, which was, you know, growth is the most popular word, and it actually, often that's referring to economic growth, which I think can be argued to be distinct from the growth where you're using more resources and pumping out more CO2 and so on. I'll yeah, argue on. with that. Yeah, argue. Okay, all right. Yes. Okay. Because it's not inevitably linked, because we can create stuff in a sustainable way which can lead to an economic growth, if not a physical growth. Okay. This is related to population growth, by the way. <laughs> what happens when I take this out of my wallet and want to purchase something? What happens, somebody had to mine something or burn something somewhere else unbeknownst to me. Or build something, Ted. Well, but build from something, from mess. <laughs> which could have been recycled. With, of which extremely little gets ever recycled yeah. for entropic reasons, because much of what we value most is too dilute to recycle. Okay? Sure. Okay? Yeah, yeah. So, so what I'm saying is that, that uh, let's go back to the population yeah. question. The population, uh, Shanti, I think, has uh, the, the, the 800 pound gorilla or the big elephant in the room of whom we <laughs> usually do not speak, okay? Because it's such a difficult issue to tackle. So, so let me just posit then that if we continue, uh, a human race continues to grow like we are, right now, we're going to crash. That's unsustainable, okay? And there's no two ifs or buts, we're going to crash. And we have many means of crashing now, uh, other than natural starvation. We can cause a nuclear war, okay? So we, we, we got better because we're so smart. Um, but, so but, but, but I Dan, prefer an approach I, where I, uh, we empower women and educate yes. women. So the, second, <laughs> uh, so, so the second choice is, is empowering women. <laughs> So, so empowering women, in <laughs> fact, is the most powerful means of preventing excessive population growth. Okay. So, so just to, to intervene there, mm -hmm. this is exactly what is said as the, the, the goals. Everybody says the eradication of poverty is yes. number one, gender equality is number two, and then as you go down the line, water, food, and all these other things yes. come further yeah. down. But the challenge is with the increasing population, what we're trying to do is do more with less. And up till now, we've mm -hmm. just been throwing things out. We just used water, throw it out, don't care about it. Food, 30% uh, gets thrown away. Oh. Uh, we, I mean, even in more in, in some... So a, a part of, of this whole thing is like, how do we manage what we actually have of limited resources to be able to sustain a population by achieving the goals of eradicating poverty, gender equality, making life better with health, et cetera, et cetera. That's when you start talking about sustainability. Go ahead. Can, I, can I just come back to that issue? Um, <laughs> to me, it boils down to consumer okay. behavior. Right? Okay. We, we, Ted brought up this example. We're going to Tamimi, and yep. every time I go there, I see people walk out with tens of plastic bags because we couldn't bring our own shopping bags, it just hurts me. When I walk outside, I see all the plastic bags flying around. 
people are joking, the national bird of the year last year was the blue plastic bag. Right? <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just very sad but true. So how do we, and this is not really research that we're all doing here and increasing our understanding, but how do we change consumer behavior? How do we bring, make people, more people to bring the bags to Tamimi, to switch off the water tap earlier, to not turn on lights in the evening in every room it's in the house? It's painfully simple, Thomas. Charge, Charge for it. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. So, so in, in, yeah. Yeah. But, but in terms of this as well, it comes to something as, as uh, fundamental as saying in some communities there is no more water, fresh water sources. You're going to have to reuse it. And so when, as soon as people start talking about wastewater for reuse or reclamation, you get the socio-economic aspects of yuck. I don't want to do that, right? So th there's a whole um, you know, gauntlet of different things we have to do in terms of public perception, understanding, social enlightenment, et cetera, et cetera, that needs to go together with the science. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we're not going to achieve it, even if we have the best science in the world, without getting the acceptance amongst uh, the population. Go ahead. Another question there? Well, thank you for all these uh, very interesting thoughts and ideas. I I heard that uh, the urban al agriculture was mentioned during this uh, conversation. Mm -hmm. I understand that I might be raising a very controversial question, uh, but I was wondering if, if I ca could hear your thoughts about feasibility of this concept. Uh, 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 and urban and urban, yeah, ag urban agriculture. agriculture. Um, urban agriculture is um, important in some contexts. Uh, like in mega cities and transport costs. So we were talking about yep. this just the other day. Transport costs and uh, environmental costs of transport are becoming increasingly significant for the movement of food, especially as the cities get big. And so I think urban agriculture has a, a role, especially when you're thinking about human nutrition and, um, and, and quality of life. But it's never going to produce the calories that we need for that 80% of the, of the food that we require. So but, you know, yeah. the biggest problem on the planet, um, uh, the biggest health problem on the planet is, is, is micronutrient deficiencies. Yes. And the biggest food-related problem on the planet isn't starvation. It's, it's actually what they call hidden hunger. And that's the incomplete nutritional profile for a person's mm. uh, proper diet. So yeah. it, urban agriculture has good roles for those sorts of things. Yeah. That's so, all. so if I could just get back to it, this, this is a new field which is just exploding now the, the, in recent years mm -hmm. for a few reasons. One is because more people are going into the cities. Yes. So you need to bring the food to where the people are. So the transportation costs and so on. Now how do you make it in the city? So now you're talking about what is called controlled environment agriculture, greenhouses, uh, vertical gardens, uh, you know, other ways of producing food using LED lights, not natural lights. It's also got to do with aquaculture, bringing uh, land-based aquaculture. So you have recycled aquaculture systems coupled with food production called aquaponics, hydroponics, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's meeting part of this mm. demand mm. in the city without having all the, the transportation, etc. And, uh, you know, like if you can grow shrimp in a city and give it directly to market instead of making it in, in Vietnam or China and spending it. all this energy in thawing and, and uh, freezing, thawing and freezing, and you have a poor quality food, right? So these are the drivers around it. And unfortunately, we haven't been doing agriculture very smart. Mm -hmm. So you have strawberry production in California which is now people are lifting their nose against it because the soils are contaminated and the contamination is in the strawberries. Mm. The consumer doesn't want it. So now the urban agriculture is growing strawberries in controlled environments without the pollutants, trying to mm -hmm. close the loops, trying to use the energy, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it, it's not going to solve everything, but I think it's going to be a, a major contribution to helping some of the, the key challenges we have in this water, food, energy nexus uh, realm. And if I may add something briefly, um, I think that the, there's, there's yet another aspect to urban agriculture. It reconnects people in urban absolutely. settings to nature. Yes, absolutely. It, it, it is so important that people do not presume that milk comes from Safeway. Um, 
uh, and so does butter and eggs, right? That they come from actually natural sources. Um, it, and also remember that most of the vegetables and the fruit we eat today are empty calories. They have very little or no micronutrients that we need to survive. Mm. We eat vitamins now and with micronutrients, but in order for us to get our micronutrients, we need to eat a lot many more apples, which most of them are just empty calories, and we grow fat. Mm. Okay, that, that's, that's another problem that we are facing with empty calories that do not mm. provide nutrition. Um, there could be more, but let's stop mm. here. Mm. Yeah. Wow, we got a lot. You need the uh, football microphone. Hi, uh, so you mentioned that one of the goals of the UN or something is uh, eradicating poverty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wonder how you can do that in a sustainable way because eradica eradicating po poverty means increasing the quality of life of everyone who's in poverty. Mm -hmm. And that would just mean uh, uh, increasing their energy usage. So how could you, if you, we can't sustain the way we live right now, how could we live where we're eradicating poverty which means increasing uh, energy usage? Well, you're asking the scientists to really stretch uh, no, outside no. their comfort. I like it. I like no. it. That, that's a very good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I, there are two answers to this question. It's an ideal to which we strive, uh, which in my, that's my opinion now, okay, which in most cases will never be achieved. Um, and so we're going to have to learn how to improve human lives through things do not require so much energy. And the quality of human life doesn't depend only on stuff we have and process, but also on the quality of our relationships mm -hmm. with our family, with our children, neighbors, right? So communities. Uh, and so we're gonna have to strengthen uh, a lot uh, the local element of survival. And we, need, we will have to provide the countries which cannot survive on their own with more means of helping themselves. This, is, this will not mean eradication of poverty everywhere, uh, but it, well, I don't even want to go there because there's so much inequality, social inequality <laughs> around the world and there's yep. such drastic problems which are caused by it that, I, that we won't even begin to discuss it, right? And we're all aware of it. Right? And, uh, and so the world will have to redefine its goals. It will have to to kind of act on the ideals we espouse, not talk and then do something entirely different, right? We talk about peace in Syria, and yet we, we are murdering more people per day than in the last seven years, okay? So, hey, where's the ideal, where's the reality? Questions, and maybe, maybe try and take it back a little bit to the research. Remember, what we're trying to do here at Kaos to answer your question about Poverty is we are trying to do more with less. The more that Tad can get out of the ground, the more that Tarove can, can uh, use less energy to desalinate water, for example, um, the more that we can improve the, the biochemistry of the crops. So, you know, there are ways to try and do more with less and achieve some of that growth. Maybe let's ask a few questions about the research. Yeah. Um, so I'd like to. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. So I'd like to pick up on where Professor Tad ended, where we have to change our like, ideas and, and con, you know, conceptions of like, how to live, right? Um, I think some of that, or a lot of that, has to do with policy making versus being yes. more efficient, because we always run into this paradox where we use more of something the more, the more efficient we are at it. Mm -hmm. And so how do we, as scientists and engineers, how can we help with policy making? With policy making? Because we're usually more driven, even by society, to be, you know, enjoying the intellectual stimulation and sometimes intellectual luxury of pushing the boundaries of science. And we're rarely in politics, for example. Mm. And so, like, how how can you know every every one of us? How can we influence um, policy making? That's in your wheelhouse, Mark. I, I know enough history to know that's in your wheelhouse. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, I, I'm very politically active, all right? and especially when I was a student, I was very politically active. And I think what we, what we do need to do is, yes, live a life 
internally as much as uh, we're, we're able, and then um, influence policymakers and actively lobby. Uh, we can set up pressure groups and we can do things publicly so when we do change stuff and try to implement a, a composting policy or a, a try to get something active in recycling on campus, that we make a noise about that and that we use that and set ourselves up as an example of how things could and should be changed. And, uh, and of course, more directly, when you get the phone call from the, from the Department of Agriculture or from the Minister for Environment, you answer that and respond as fully and as quickly as you can, because that's really when you've got quite a bit of influence. I mean, we as individuals have influence two times mainly when we spend a dollar and we put a, a vote in a ballot box. But as, as, as scientists and experts here at a, at a respected institution, we've really got lots of other opportunities where we can influence through lobbying and, um, and also by example. Yeah, it's not so necessarily represented on the panel, but w we do have plenty of researchers here who are looking at mangroves, and you can quantify for example, our mangroves here of Kaust have, have grown 20% since we've been keeping track. And you can quantify how much extra CO2 is captured by that. Um, we do have faculty that are, uh, that are looking at um, uh, the environmental uh, studies that are necessary for developments along the Red Sea. So if this growth, if this development is going to happen, we can quantify the science. We can make sure that the corals are going to be protected as that development occurs. So, I do think there are plenty of, ex of examples at Kaust, even represented by some of these faculty, of, of, of taking action that becomes the numbers, answering the call, as, as Mark said, to become the numbers for that policy. So go plant a mangrove. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah. or, or even if I can say, not only being the, the people with the, with the numbers and the data and so on, but actually getting involved in politics. What's wrong with the educated uh, scientists and engineers from our, our system becoming a politician, so to speak, mm -hmm. right? Being uh, in that interaction with making decisions and policies based on the information and so forth. Not just standing on the outside screaming, but also being part of trying to make the right. And, yeah. and if I may just add, so, you know, um, as a faculty at Berkeley, I stumbled into politics uh, by happenstance. Um, I had a freshman seminar uh, with freshman students in Berkeley in 2003 where we analyzed the uh, food systems and the energy flowing through them and we came to the question of corn ethanol, you know, the mm -hmm. new mm -hmm. rising biofuel. Mm -hmm. And of course we did an analysis and then uh, I published a paper with the class. Okay? And Berkeley liked it so much that they did a press release and this was in May, I think, of 2004. And unbeknownst to us, this was the year when the new ethanol bill was passing through mm. Congress, uh, mm. touting the benefits of ethanol, which was inconsistent with our conclusion, and all hell broke loose. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, I, I had no idea how fast I got a bloody nose, and, yes. and it redefined my life uh, since then. In fact, um, uh, coming against uh, corn ethanol and then uh, coming against, uh, you know, many other biofuels uh, and the, because of their environmental impacts. And then talking about mangroves in Indonesia and, uh, and other places where they were cut for shrimp ponds and for agriculture and, and, and silted away and killed because of palm plantations upstream from them. It was difficult at the time but I think after 15 years now, when I grew uh, wiser and people actually also began to understand that there are side effects of these wonderful new processes that we introduce into uh, the world and their environmental impacts uh, that they have. Agriculture is a huge, monstrous industry. If you add the area of agricultural fields for major crops, they are more than the Indian subcontinent. Oh, yes. Okay? And so they use giant amounts of resources and they create giant amounts of pollution. CO2, ammonia, uh, you know, pesticides, herbicides, everything. That all of this impacts all aspects of our life. And so I am in the field which provides petroleum to produce those pesticides and the fuels. 
and to, pro to produce methane from which the nitrogen fertilizer is then produced. But, and fuel to mine those uh, phosphates, which are not renewable on a human time scale. We still have quite a few deposits in North Africa, but, but you know, uh, mm. it's a very limiting step for humanity. Mm. No plant will grow without phosphate, and phosphate gets fixed and wasted in no time if you do it improperly. Mm. So I let, <laughs> yeah. Time for a few more questions. Yeah, back there. Somebody get him the microphone. You can do it. Good afternoon. My name is Michael. Um, I'm actually only a visitor here. Um, I've just retired from a career um, batting for sustainable agriculture in sub-Sahara Africa. Unfortunately, a bit of a losing game because everyone is interested in growth rather than sustainability. But that has already been said. I concur with everything said so far and it's all good and it's all right. I would like to ask a question though. I come here as a visitor and I have to admit this is a truly awesome place. It, it blows you away. I, I was blown away by all the buildings, all the facility. It's just an out of the world place. However, very soon after that I start asking questions about how sustainable is all this? <laughs> and um, I would like to ask, because um, I'm a hands-on guy, um, what policies or what ideas, if any, are in place to make KAUST a beacon for the world for sustainability? Because at the moment, I agree with the gentleman here, I have the impression KAUST is run on fossil fuels one way or another. Mm -hmm. yes. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I think you will also admit the sustainability of cows is questionable. So that's a fact. Mm -hmm. um, but are there policies, ideas of things that can be put in place yeah. to make this amazing place um, a leader or an example mm -hmm. in sustainability? Yeah. I mean, so just to answer it broadly, and then I'll let the faculty tackle it. We have a sustainability committee, and from the facility side, KAUST is really on the bleeding edge. Uh, that's the whole reason for the sustainability month, in terms of looking at solar, looking at potentially wind installations, um, looking at energy savings, water savings. I think KAUST has some pretty progressive policies on the facilities and, and, and the maintenance side of things. Um, that, that, I mean, that's the whole reason for this month is to educate the, the cows community about, about those opportunities. And I think there's more to come. Um, but I know the faculty want to say a few specific things about being that leader. So. Oh, there's lots of willingness to be sustainable, but I think there's a long way to go to be um, truly much more sustainable than we actually are. And I'd love to see things like... Um, the, the, the treatment of all the gar garden waste, for example, it's unbelievable. This just gets dumped to landfill, and I hate to think of the methane or whatever that's produced, and we're in a soil that's gagging, an environment that's gagging for more organic inputs. So that's just one example. I would have thought, although we recycle the water, um, I, I yes, just, I'm sure that the production the, of the water... Yeah, it goes to the golf course instead of to, to food production <laughs> or something else. So <laughs> it's like the choices of, of what you do, but it is done. I mean, like, like John said, all the wastewater is recycled because it's treated to a very high quality. Now, we produce fresh water from desalination. So we're using a lot of energy on that and trying to, to optimize that. But could we offset the amount of energy needed to make desalinated water by recycling the wastewater in a different way and by water conservation and so on and so on. Those are some of the things going on and, and being discussed not only you know within the science but also with the facilities and the people operation in charge of the operations. So uh, I think uh, Mark is right we still have a long way to go but I think uh, we're, we're pretty much pounding the pavement as good as we can to try and make an impact. It's a lot of willing. And there's some good design aspects of the buildings actually which make them a lot greener than, they, than you might think. So there's a lot of very sophisticated design features as well. Mm -hmm. But it could obviously be done even better. But, okay, so, so I wanted to say what a great question. Yeah. <laughs> and 
And remember that with this amount of concentration of science, not everything will be sustainable, right? So supercomputing uh, mm. uses three and a half megawatts of power continuously. And if a fast train between Medina and, 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 and Jeddah and Mecca comes through, there's a hiccup and we may have a problem with the supercomputer because the system is so sensitive to power load. So obviously, uh, that is not quite sustainable. However, in our outreach, because of what happens with this unsustainable use of energy, we are creating sustainable solutions for more elsewhere and here at KAUST, right? So yes. better solar cells, better systems that clean dust from solar cells. Everybody knows that there is lots of sun in the desert. Hardly anybody talks about dust, which is a limiting factor here, and lack of water, okay? Um, also, uh, technologies of reuse, which we talked amply about, and of improving agriculture, of improving social awareness uh, about the limitations of what we do, and sometimes we also need to do what we preach. And faculty are notoriously unsustainable in terms of our flying. Mm -hmm. Our flying footprint is giant. Okay? So that's completely unsustainable as well. So perhaps we need to think about more teleconferencing, which would be less unsustainable. Uh, so it's a degree of unsustainability. And KAUST is a marvelous uh, project on, a, on the global scale. And it's a process. We're going to be better. We're going to do better. We're going to be more sustainable as we go on. And hopefully, we're going to raise awareness of environmental issues and problems in the entire region and, of course, in the kingdom. And that's a huge role we play because it's not just about cost. We may be completely unsustainable, but we're tiny. Our impact is actually very small in terms of our you know, carbon footprint and what have you. But if we cause changes to the global use of energy and how we use the Red Sea and what we do to the soil and how we irrigate the fields in Saudi Arabia, that or and in the region, that impact is thousands of times more than what cows will ever use. So you need to look at this in a little bit broader perspective. No, not everything here will be sustainable. Yes, we're going to try to increase overall sustainability of the bigger system in which we live. Okay. Uh, on that, I, I know you guys are excited, but we have to do one thing. I'm going to call up Tony Valenzuela, our VP for Facilities Management. Um, they actually have an award that they want to give on behalf of the Sustainability Committee, and uh, we figure that that's uh, an appropriate way to end today. Uh, and and when, we're, when we're done with that, Tony's here, uh, Muna is here, this is your Sustainability Committee. If you have suggestions, I'm sure that they want to listen to them, and I know the faculty would love to hear more questions uh, and, and talk with you further about sustainability. So Tony, did you want to come up and say a few words about this award from the Sustainability Committee? Good afternoon, and uh, thank you uh, to the great panels to really talk about the passion of all we're doing at KAUST. So the Sustainability Committee was formed over two years ago, and uh, the question that was last asked about what are we doing about sustainability and how are we going to improve KAUST. So we've had a committee now that's been working on this over three years, and we've set certain uh, plans and milestones to take us to 2025. In fact, uh, we presented to the Board of Trustees in the last December board meeting what exactly the steps we're, gonna, we're taking to make KAUST the premier benchmark for sustainability. Are we there? No, we are absolutely not there. But through the help of the committee and also with the help of the research team, the help of the community, we're on a very good trajectory. One example of how we're much more sustainable than other universities, just to give you one example in terms of the question in the back, all of our campus facilities are cooled from a central plant. Um, by nature, laboratories are uh, energy hungry because, you, because of the safety aspects. It's only a one pass through, means you cannot recirculate the air. So by its nature, it's very, very uh, inefficient. However, at KAUS, we have a central plant where all of our buildings are cooled from a central plant, which makes it very efficient. 
relatively speaking, to any other university in the world. So on a, on a energy intensity and a, on a square, per, square footage measure, I would argue that nobody else in, in any other research institute has a better kilowatt hour per square in terms of the cost and, and in terms of the carbon emission as cost. We have a huge, uh, energy, uh, basically, uh, research complex, and that footprint is really amazingly just from, from that central power is, is, is something that, mm -hmm. same thing with the reuse of uh, wastewater. Mm -hmm. uh, very few cities could claim the amount of re water reuse that we have. Uh, we've lowered our potable water consumption for 30% over the last two years, and all of our wastewater is now used for one third of our irrigation. So not just the golf course, the King of the Monument, all the main boulevard as you come into Kaos is all tertiary treated water that we take from the community. We treat it and we pump it back, not into the ocean, but we pump it back. Uh, if you compare that to Southern California, where I came from, the Orange County Sanitation District, they take all the wastewater and pump it five miles into the Pacific Ocean. Sure. So I mean, how sustainable is that? No. So yes, there are aspects of Kaos that are not sustainable yet, but there's aspects of Kaos that are very sustainable, and so we want to continue that march. Uh, going back to the committee, I uh, want to bring up here Mr. Jorge Ramos. Come on, give him a ripple. <laughs> so uh, when we started the Sustainability Committee, uh, we went to the Vice President of Academic Affairs. We went, uh, we, the committee is actually formed of several faculty. Uh, we also have a student, and so Jorge was appointed as a student and representative, and so from the start of the of the sustainability committee he's been there for the last over maybe three years and uh one i could tell and Tober is also on the committee jorge has the highest attendance of any committee member i think he has a 95 percent attendance because I, I did take role and so he's actually doing he does better than the professors and even some of the professionals so he's, he leads by example but Jorge, i want to thank you uh, you you were part of this committee that made a lot, of thing, a lot of changes, a lot of great ideas. As a student, you were vocal, you, you had a strong voice, and you really made a difference. And we really are so proud that you're our product. Uh, we saw your graduation, but really, muchas gracias. <laughs> well, it, uh, it was an honor, of course, uh, to, to all the discussions we did and, and, and the, the, the goals that we have set and that we're uh, aiming to fulfill. I think that's a, that's a great, takeaway that I can have as a student here. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's a really great experience. And uh, yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed my time. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. thank you, Tony. Thank you guys in the audience. Again, I think you've seen today that on a facility side, on being a leader, KAUST is trying to do as much as we can. Uh, and, and we're here to ask questions and, and to do more. I think on the research side and, and just in terms of expertise and education, we're trying to lead the way as well. So thank you for attending this iCafe and we look forward to seeing you next time.